from Michigan, a native Detroiter. Anybody from Michigan in the house? All right, see, now one person from Detroit just put all of Texas to shame. Because earlier I said Texas, I don't know if y'all was here, and it was crickets in this joint. In any case, Elizabeth James is the program manager for the Department of Afro-American and African Studies at the University of Michigan. She is a native Detroiter with degrees from the University of Michigan in the history of art, communications, and a master's in journalism. She also holds a master's of science in library science from Wayne State University, along with postgraduate work and study in the School of Information at UM Elizabeth. She is, I'm sorry, UM. <laughs> Elizabeth assists with scheduling, planning, and implementing the department's many programs, as well as performs as its outreach coordinator, including study abroad programs and outreach initiatives across the country, and serving as a committee member of the annual Martin Luther King Jr. Symposium, the largest academic celebration in the nation. She most cherishes her extracurricular work as a third generation storyteller, along with serving as an advisor for the Black Student Union and the National Council of Negro Women, along with the UM's Transplant Center for young recipients like herself as a resident storyteller. Elizabeth has been awarded the University of Michigan's highest honor for diversity issues, the Harold R. Johnson Diversity Service Award, as well as the Advisor of the Year by the Office of Student Affairs and a Cornerstone Award from the Black Celebratory, among other honors for her service and dedication to the student community. Ladies and gentlemen, giving our fearless idea-themed topic, What's Your Story? Finding Your Life's Meaning Through Storytelling and the Hero's Quest, Elizabeth James. In the beginning, there was the word and the world. This beautiful African proverb aptly describes how we have always cherished stories. Storytelling is a natural part of our lives. I am a third generation storyteller and my entire life has been immersed in a world of words that were flowing from my grandmother, my mother, and many others who told stories and spun tales that would enchant, enlighten, and delight me. It's so important to realize that words do matter, the things we say, because storytelling is a multi-sensory experience, and so it impacts us on a number of levels. From the earliest humans who gathered around the fire to share their everyday experiences to the present day where we Skype with one another and blog endlessly, we are all engaged in telling stories to one another. It's so, so beautiful to see the ways that people interact and connect through the use of stories whether it be a phone call to a friend at the end of a long, hard day, or when you're with your best friends and you're sharing stories about what a professor has done or what kind of an exam you've just undergone. All of these things are important to remember because they will create your memories and they are become a part of the essence of who you are. But what's your story? What I'd like to do today is share with you a variety of different story styles and take you behind the curtain of storytelling. I'm going to tell you some different ways that storytellers approach stories and see if you can recognize some of these types of things that happen in stories that you may recognize in your own life. If so, you may be able to adapt the patterns so that you're able to do different things and achieve the goals that you seek in life. I hope that they'll be helpful for you, as they have been for me. As you can tell, I do love a good story. The first type of story that I'd like to share is one that's called revelation. Revelation is when we find, just like a baby, that everything is new and amazing. You move from thing to thing, exploring, discovering, all of these things are so exciting. Well, the only issue is that if you engage only in a life of revelation, you find yourself somewhat like Alice in Wonderland or Jason Bourne getting caught up in his multiple identities. 
You don't know who you are because everything's coming at you all at once. It perhaps is better to seek a type of balance so that you're able to find your middle ground so that you can move forward in life. The next type of story that we storytellers like to call a mirror is when you have a type of experience where you find characters who are trying to replicate step by step the life of someone else, perhaps someone they admire. This often doesn't go very well because in order to have a truly full life, you must embrace who you are and be authentic to yourself, to thine own self be true. This you can see in all manner of stories, whether it be the Sneetches and the Brilliant Tale by Dr. Seuss, who engage in all manner of one-upmanship and hierarchies, or in the very sorrowful tale by Hans Christian Andersen of the Little Mermaid, who does not end with such a happy version as what Disney depicts, sadly. You find that you're wasting precious time chasing someone else's dream. And unfortunately, in chasing after what the Joneses have, you find that the grass isn't always greener on the other side. It's more important to follow your own dream. So I say, keep swimming with the current El Nemo, not against it. The next type of story is similar in a way, but it's two lives that are running parallel. The parallel story you often find with married couples, as long as they're able to con maintain their own identity, even as many life events run side by side. You find this in a lot of stories, and they're very, very successful if they're done well like an Agatha Christie novel, a mystery that has the protagonist, the investigator chasing after the murderer. Or, in another example, Dalton Abbey, where you see behind the scenes the lives of many different people living at the same time, all under the same roof. That's a wonderful way to experience life, you know, with that understanding that you are a part of a group. However, you have to maintain your individuality. The next style is different. It's rather challenging. It's called digression. And digression is a story within a story. And usually right around finals time, you may find yourself engaging in this when you've got multiple exams going on and you're trying to write papers or you're engaged in a relationship and you're trying to balance your family with your relationship and all the things that that entails. These can be very difficult, as you find with Luke Skywalker in Star Wars or Seely in The Color Purple, where they begin to find these revelatory me moments in their lives, even as they're trying to just basically hang on and survive. Even though it is difficult, the key to success with this type of story in your life is that you must rely on others. Support networks, friends, allies, they are the ones that ground you and help keep you through all of the challenges that you might face. The next type of storyline is one that's kind of for the carefree people in the room. It's the circular storyline. And we storytellers refer to it as a circle of pearls because it usually is containing different vignettes that move around and all around and around and around so that they circle back to the beginning. And the good part of it is that it gives you a freedom so that you're able to just experience life as it comes. However, if you end up being like Tigger and Winnie the Pooh, you're kind of bouncing around without any aim or purpose, and that can sometimes be very difficult to deal with if you don't have any focus in your life. Perhaps the thing to do is that you must find some way to focus on defining life on your own terms so that you don't find yourself ending up like a U2 song I still haven't found what I'm looking for. 
getting to the end of your life and wondering what was the meaning of it all. Another style that also is very, very common in life is that you find yourself dealing with people who are in meta-narration. These are people who are very self-important. They speak in an omniscient voice and never in the first person. This is a person with big problems. <laughs> And I hope that you don't have to deal with very many of them. Though, when you have to get into the real world and deal with bosses, this is something you probably will run into. These are people who refer to themselves in the third person so that if you do have a good situation, say, for example, Aesop's fables that use that omniscient voice, it's wonderful. But if you find yourself encountering people who say something like, Jimmy needs to get some dinner, like the character on Seinfeld, you need to reevaluate your importance in the world. It's really important to take note that unless you're a monarch, like Queen Elizabeth, who is permitted to use the royal we, you should refrain from using this around your other fellow mortals. The last one is one that I hope that you will not use. It is also kind of a downer. It's a regressive life, and you do know some people who are kind of like Pigpen and Charlie Brown, walking around with a perpetual cloud over their head. This is the type of person that can, and again, in fiction, it's beautiful. F. Scott, F. Scott Fitzgerald, classic, The Curious Case of Benjamin Button, recounts the tale of a protagonist that begins its, his life as an old man and then moves forward through time until eventually he grows into a baby. The sad thing is that as a ch baby, he recalls none of the rest of his life, whereas for those of us who move in a progressive way, we do have a whole treasure trove of memories to have at the end of our lives. What you have to do with that type of if you get into that type of mindset, is to just remember that your birth wasn't the highlight of your life. The room is to embark on your own heroic journey. The hero's journey is the ultimate story that was best described by the brilliant author and mythologist Joseph Campbell. And I'd like to share with you an example of a heroic journey using an archetype that many of us can identify with, Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz. I choose Dorothy because she's a female, as I am, and also because she contained a lot of great characteristics that I think embody a true hero. So it all begins with the realization that something in your life needs to change. You alone can only know what that is. You must listen to your inner voice. Dorothy realized that Kansas didn't hold all the answers that she needed in life, and she began to imagine another world, one that was somewhere over the rainbow. What an amazing thing. For myself, when I was diagnosed with cryptogenic cirrhosis, I began to realize that I was about to embark on a journey unlike anything I'd ever experienced in my entire life. So the journey begins, and the next step is to cross the threshold. This usually comes after some reluctance and some hesitation. Consider, for example, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. When he initially began working with the Civil Rights Movement, he hesitated about being the leader of the Montgomery bus boycott just as Dorothy tried to run away from her problems at home and ended up in Oz. For myself, it was the realization after great deliberation and consultation with my family and loved ones and my medical professors, professionals that I would have to undergo a transplant. And the writing of my name to sign off to be placed on the transplant list was a very huge threshold crossing moment for me. After that, once you've crossed that threshold, you can't go back. You must continue forward, even though the next step is very intimidating. It's what is known 
as the temptations and obstacles. Dorothy had to undergo all manner of things in the Emerald City, whether it be running through that forest that was horribly frightening or dealing with the winged monkeys, even falling asleep in the tempting poppies. For myself, it was undergoing different treatments and tests, procedures that really wore on my spirit. But I knew, especially because I had some amazing allies, just as Dorothy did, that I had to keep moving forward. There was no turning back. You have to get through those obstacles and challenges in order to become your true, true self. After that, after that transformation, and that moment of moving through the threshold and facing those obstacles, you reach the pinnacle or the abyss, <laughs> whichever you're headed to. In both cases, it's a very, very reckoning moment that often results in victory because you've undergone so many things in order to get to that space. For Dorothy, when she stepped on that path to head to that castle, she knew she had to defeat the witch. She knew it had to be about her or that elf of the, it was something, somebody was going to come go down. For myself, when I was admitted into the hospital, my doctors were battling to sustain my life until an organ donor could be found. I knew it was now or never and when I got the word the night that I was very, very ill, that an organ had been found in Chicago, so what up, Chicago? And that they were air vacuuming it over to the University of Michigan, to me, I found myself thinking, okay, this is that moment. I began to pray. My sister was with me, and we really tried to just focus all that energy on that moment that this was it. And afterwards, when I did awake in a very, very not lucid state, I was so filled with gratitude. It was an overwhelming feeling. Just as Dorothy was so overwhelmed once she held that broomstick in her hand, there's a moment that occurs at then that is so transformative that you realize that it's certainly this whole journey has not been about you, but about all that has been encompassed in that whole experience. It's the moment that I think the hip-hop artist Drake best described in Started From the Bottom, Now We're Here. He so eloquently brings into full circle how he had the rise to fame and yet, at the same time, still ponders the cost that it has give, that he has gone through for the life that he now has. It's something that you find yourself thinking about over and over, and it's not something that ever truly ends because you have been transformed, and you're not the same person that you were before. The next part is a little tricky. Just as you had allies on your way crossing that threshold, you have to have allies to get you back to reality. You kind of feel invincible. You're flying, you're feeling good, just as Dorothy did when she returned to the Emerald City, only to realize that what she really missed was home, and she wanted to go back, but she needed help. That help came from Glenda, who told her that she was in control of her destiny. Just as my doctors told me, this is on you now. It's going to be up to you to have to deal with what comes once you leave our care here in the hospital. It's a very, very intimidating moment. But just as Dorothy felt when she clicked her heels three times, and I felt when I took my first breath of fresh air after a month of hospital air, which I promise you is not the best, there is nothing that can describe it. I think the thing that is the sweetest of all is that for Dorothy and myself, it was our loved ones who were waiting there for us on the other side in that real world that drew us back because love, when it's pure and true, is the ultimate, ultimate cure. And so 
there you have the heroic journey. You've returned, you're transformed, and now you find yourself a whole new person. As a storyteller, I love to hear people's stories because each time I hear about challenges that have been overcome and that somehow through all kinds of challenges people have made it to the other side, it makes me realize how incredibly resilient we are and how important our stories are because through sharing them, another person may feel stronger and may feel that they have the power to take on a challenge in their life. And so, just as Glenda said, I'd say to you, you have it in you. It's been with you all along. What you must believe is that you too can take on your own heroic journey, and I wish all the best to you. Thank you. <laughs>